I would like to welcome our first speaker today, Dr. Sudhir Kumar. He is a friend and a colleague uh, that I work with. We work together at Sheikh Shachbut Medical City. He will be talking to us today about Bell's palsy, and he is a consultant neurologist. Uh, Dr. Sudhir. Greetings, how are you? Hi, how are you? Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Hi. Hi. <laughs> well, welcome, yeah. and thank you for speaking to us today with Bell's Palsy, for, about Bell's Palsy. The virtual floor is yours, Dr. Kumar. Thank you, Dr. Shatila. Good afternoon, everybody. So let us begin today's session. Uh, as in cricket, we say, I'll be the opening batsman for the day. And let us begin the show. So uh, no disclosures, no conflict of uh, interest. And the objective is to discuss the treatment of Bell's palsy, which is a very common clinical entity that uh, we come across in day-to-day -day practice. So the, te the, the technical definition would be Bell's palsy is an idiopathic facial paralysis, which is the most common cause of unilateral facial paralysis characterized by an acute unilateral peripheral low motor type of paralysis that gradually results over time in 80 to 90 percent of the cases. And uh, we'll start with the scenario. It's a, it's a common one that we encounter a medical student, a four year old, who noticed that he has got uh, difficulty in moving his left side of the face while shaving. And he got worried that he's uh, got a stroke, which is a very typical concern for the patients most of the time. And he had a history of influenza the past week. On examination, he was found to have poor wrinkling on the left side. Also, he could not show the teeth properly. He could not purse his lips, and there was inadequate closure of the eyes. He also had abnormal taste on the anterior two-thirds of the tongue on the left side, and there was reduced lacrimation on the left. And he have also had hyperacusis on the left. There were no other additional signs. So what is what are the possibilities? So let us go to some details. We will start always with our forefathers, the one on the uh, right side, who is the great father of uh, gynecology as well as, I mean, uh, uh, forefather in gynecology as well as the famous fallopian tube person, Gabriel Fallopi. On his name is also the facial canal is also known. And uh, on the left side, you see Sir Charles Bell. He is the person who did a lot of uh, uh, new anatomical studies, especially he is the one who is differentiated fifth cranial nerve from the seventh, the sensory, the motor pathway, like that. So after giving due obeisance to our forefathers, let us move further with the basic anatomy. And uh, as you know, the cranial nerve, seventh cranial nerve is from the pons. And it has got an intrapontine uh, part where it curves around the abducen nucleus and comes out. And as it comes out, it has got additional uh, fibers for, for the uh, from the solitary and the salivatory nucleus, the preganglionic parasympathetic fibers from the salivatory nucleus which join from the fibers which come from the uh, nervous intermediates and it comes out. So once it comes out from the pons at the cerebellar pontine angle, it has got a small bit of extra pontine but intracranial pathway which is just outside the CP angle. Soon it gets into the intra uh, pathway where the fibers go through the internal auditory canal along with the vestibular portion of the eighth cranial nerve and it continues its course in its bony canal the fallopian canal and exits from the skull through the stylomastoid foramen and during this course it has all the uh, branches which is the great superficial petrosal nerve which carrying the parasympathetic fibers the extra petrosal external petrosal nerve, the small petrosal nerve, as well as the nerve to the stapedius and the taste fibers which are carried in the chorda tympani. So the sensory part, the nervous intermediates, is the sensory fiber, fiber from the tongue, oral mucosa, and the post-auricular skin as well. And it also contains the parasympathetic fibers to the salivary and lacrimal glands. Uh, the two ga major ganglions are one is the submandibular gland, ganglion as well as the pterygopalatine ganglion which supplies the parasympathetic fibers for the nose palate and the lacrimal glands 
as you can see here. So once it comes out of the stylomastoid foramen, uh, it is in the bed of the uh, parotid gland, where it gives uh, the posterior auricular nerve, the nerve to the nigastric and the nerve to stylohyoid, and subsequently divides inside the parotid gland into the major terminal branches, the zygomatic, the buccal, the mandibular, and the cervical branches supplying the muscles of the facial expressions. So that is in brief about the anatomy, uh, because when we want to drive a car, drive a place, we need to know the pathway well. So that is the importance of the anatomy. Now the epidemiology of the illness, it, is, it has got an annual incidence somewhere between 15 to 13 cases per 100,000 population. And it accounts for about 60 to 70% of cases of acute unilateral facial paralysis. And 60% um, more times it is on the right. And it, rarely, less than 1%, it can be bilateral simultaneous Wells palsy. The risk is more for the diabetics, people who are immunosuppressed, and also in pregnant females, in, especially in the third trimester. And it has a recurrence rate of 4 to 14%, especially in diabetics. And there is no gender inequality. And uh, the incidence is less in people who are young and is the highest in people who are above 60. Etiology, the, 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 the most important villain is herpes simplex virus. The other ones which are also uh, implicated include the herpes zoster, Epstein-Barr virus, cytomegalovirus, HIV, some of the other uh, uh, infectious uh, organs including the Lyme disease, Borrelia, but Godfrey, or the syphilis, mycoplasma, rickets cell. Or it could be de novo as in diabetes or hypertension. And interestingly, there is a genetic predisposition as well. And uh, people in families tend to get the illness for, so there, there are few studies even inciting that. And of course, pregnancy is by itself. So the pathophysiology, uh, it's always the popular theory which says there is edema and ischemia of the facial nerve which is causing compression in the bony canal. And as you know, the anatomically, that is the narrowest part is the first portion, the facial canal. So it gets injured and inflamed. So depending upon the site of the injury, the manifestations can vary as if the lesion is distal to the stylomastoid foramen, it, it will have only pure facial paralysis, as against if it is proximal to the gen geniculate ganglion, the motor paralysis are usually accompanied by the gestatory and autonomic abnormalities. Apart from splitting the hair, uh, as far as the prognosis is concerned, the various manifestations actually do not have uh, any prognostic significance. But from an anatomical point of view and teaching purposes, this kind of splitting is interesting. So the early symptoms at the onset of the, uh, typically, classically, it is onset is less than 48 hours. There will be weakness of the facial muscles, pure eyelid closure. And there can be pain in the face, ear, mastoid area. There can be alteration in the taste, hyperacusis. That is, even normal sounds are heard louder tingling and numbness of the cheek or mouth, which is explained by the abnormal motor sensation, mo abnormal motor symptom rather than real sensory involvement. Though there are uh, theories and postulations saying that Bell's palsy can be accompanied by uh, associated fifth, even ninth and tenth cranial nerve palsies as well, the same pathology involving the multiple cranial nerves. People can have epiphora, ocular pain, blurred vision, posterior auricular pain as well. And uh, let me also tell the late manifestation patients can attend the clinic late, not need not be acute. They can come say three months or four months or six months down the road. So they can have mild generalized mass contracture of the facial muscles, rendering the affected palpebral fissure narrower, narrower than the opposite actually. And you can have uh, problems, motor as well as autonomic synkinesis due to aberrant regeneration of the facial nerve, where you can have, you know, the reverse jaw pinking, where the contracture of the facial muscles with twitching of the corner of the mouth or dimpling of the chin occurring with each blink, or the uh, crocodile tears, the classical one, where the tearing occurs along with chewing. And uh, very rarely you can, one can have dysphagic facial paralysis. 
So physical examination, one needs to focus on head, ears, eyes, nose, throat. Look for always look for secondary causes like presence of skin carcinomas or a parotid tumor or any recent dental procedures whereby you know inadvertently some trauma can occur. So the classical clinical facial uh, findings in the facial muscles are you can have loss of voluntary movement of the upper and lower part of the face. That is the importance. It's a lower motor kind of paralysis. So the entire face is involved. And uh, there will be disappearance of the nasolabial fold. And uh, of course, dropping at the affected corner of the mouth, which is drawn to the unaffected side. So this is the left, uh, left side of the face where there is lack of wrinkling. The eye is open. The nasolabial fold is gone. and the, the, the mouth is drooped on that side with there is a pull onto the normal side. So when he tries to close the eye, you can see the eye is not closing and you can see the sclera here. So when there is lagging of the eye, you will have the normal uh, uprolling of the eyeball is seen, which is called the Bell's phenomenon. That, so that's one of the ocular manifestations. The on long term exposure, they can have exposure keratitis. The brow can droop. And of course, there will be overactivity of the levator palpebrae superiors, which is supplied by the third nerve. So they can have upright retraction. And of course, they can have decreased tear output. And long term, they can have corneal erosions. So ear findings, they can have, as I said earlier, you always look for secondary causes like acute and chronic otitis media, if there is a history of, especially if there is a history of ear surgery. Also look for any rash, as in herpes or oticus, which is called Ramsey-Hunt syndrome. So look specifically for the rashes and look for the sensation, especially in the posterior auricular area. And uh, one can check for hyperacusis using a stethoscope where you can use the bell of the stethoscope. You keep the stethoscope on the ear of the patient and you scratch the bell and look for hyperacusis on the affected side. So other physical examination, check for the taste and salivation in the mouth and finish the clinical examination by rest of the cranial nerves, motor sensory and rest of the neurological examination. So of course, always there is the, the doubt comes whether it is a central or a peripheral, I'm sorry, uh, involvement. So as I said earlier, the lower motor means is the final common pathway. So both the upper and lower part of the face is affected and uh, one can have a peripheral kind of pattern even in a central lesion, like if the nucleus of the uh, seventh cranial nerves is involved in the pons, you can have a weakness on the same side of, uh, I mean, on the opposite side of the lesion. So that is, and again, one should also know that the upper part of the face is usually bilaterally represented in the brain. So that is why in the upper motor neuron lesions, the upper part of the face is spared. And this is the usual question one faces in the exams for the undergraduate and the postgraduate exams. And uh, we always think it is the representative, we always make the mistake of saying there is supply from both sides. It's not the supply, but the representation in the brain, which is more important. Now, once you make a diagnosis of a lower motor facial palsy, you need to you know, grade how how bad it is. So because the prognosis can be uh, kind, kind of uh, made from the initial uh, presentation itself. So looking at the way the patient is able to close his eyes, how much is the mouth is moving? And also how much is the, the, the appearance of the face at the rest? One can divide the uh, facial muscle involvement the into it is actually for the all the common facial nerve injuries but we can use the same uh, grading in uh, patients with bell's palsy as well so people with uh, no movement at all is graded as grade 6 and people with good movements of eye as well as the mouth is graded as grade 1 to 2 so in between uh, the grading is grade 3 and 4 so people with complete facial paralysis is called grade six, which has got the worst prognosis generally. So the house Brackman is one, there are so many types of uh, classification. Uh, the idea is whenever one sees the patient initially, 
try to put a grading so that uh, from a medical legal point of view also you, one knows what was the prognosis i mean what was the status of the patient at the time of the uh, presentation the complications are reversal damage to the facial nerve synkinesis partial and complete blindness and hemifacial spasms dr sidir yeah five minutes remain okay so the diagnosis from the clinical examination as i told you so the red herrings are the paralysis involving the lower portion of the face the contralateral weakness of the diplopia if the gradual onset of facial paralysis occurs there is a history of trauma or infection if the progress beyond 7 to 10 days or there is a bilateral facial palsy so differential diagnosis are apart from the infections you need to think about uh, stroke or mass lesions so if it is bilateral the common ones you need to think is guillain barre or inflammatory causes like sarcoid or infectious like lyme meningitis or even rarely bilateral neurofibromas so the routine blood tests are not done except if you think secondary causes so depending upon the scenario you order the blood test and routine uh, imaging is not required but if one does a routine imaging one can see inflamed uh, seventh cranial nerve in the canal but routine investigation is not done only one when one suspects secondary cause again same thing with uh, uh, the electro diagnostic tests routine diagnostics are not required and as you know in nerve conduction studies initially can be normal but if there is a, a prognostic and reason if you see the patient late you can uh, prognosticate how bad the condition is by looking for example in this patient there is a right and left difference in the amplitude so this indicates that the left is actually smaller than i mean is affected more than the left so if it is is the difference difference is 50% or more in the amplitude the prognosis is not really good so management as we all know is with using steroids generally you give steroids for i mean depending upon the convenience the one that is really proven what that is what is done is generally either you give for continuously about 60 to 80 mg per day roughly 1 mg per kg body weight for about 5 days then taper every day 10 mg or one can give for one week 1 mg per kg body weight and stop and equally important is you need to rule out uh, the side effects and the possible complications of steroid like diabetes hypertension peptic ulcer history all these we need to do along with that one has to take care of the eyes so care of the eyes is equally important uh, the resting eye closure is important so if the patient has an open eye at night you need to ask uh, to uh, use a pad or paste the eye and also there ask the patient uh, drops like refreshed ears so efficacy of steroids is well known right dr sidir your yeah. voice is breaking yeah. up yeah okay can you hear me now yes so the role of phys physical and stimulation therapy is actually it is not proven at all all these therapies like mind therapy massage electric stimulation acupuncture i know people are doing all sorts of thing but there is no significant benefit or harm was found from any of these uh, therapies that we are doing so follow up care is required if you find new symptoms or worsening of symptoms or if there is incomplete recovery so the prognosis is generally very good especially with steroids so the risk factors for incomplete recovery are se severe presentation of uh, more, uh, grade 4 or above above 40 years diabetes uncontrolled hypertension as well as the chance for recurrence which is seen in about 7 to 10 15% of patients if you have uh conditions like for example if there is a alternate di other diagnosis other than idiopathic that is there underlying or like for example sarcoid or people who get pregnant again or if there is a family history so once there is an incomplete apparent recovery one has to have a multimodality approach you we need plastic and reconstructive surgeries there are different methods which is beyond this scope of this talk of course we need to look at the psychological impact we need to you know kind of take the patient in his confidence and we need to speak to them about the recovery 
and uh, the patient confidence is very important to prevent risk of depression so coming back to the scenario where we had this 24 year old medical student with left sided facial weakness the diagnosis is most likely peripheral facial paralysis bell's palsy because he has no long track signs he has all the symptoms and signs related to a seventh cranial lower motor nerve palsy these are my references thank you very much Thank you very much, Dr. Sadir, for the very informative lecture on Bell's palsy. Thank you. So we actually have a couple of questions. I'll start off. There's one question from Muhammad Ahmed Ibrahim. Thank you very much for the question. And it is, how to differentiate idiopathic facial palsy from facial palsy as a complication from diabetes and any difference in treatment? Yeah. <laughs> Thank you very it's much for the one. nice question. It's a very hard question, actually. Uh, again, patients with diabetics, they are prone for all mono neuro, mononeuropathies, and uh, seventh cranial nerve is not an exception. So they can present. So uh, if the patient presents within three days, and if you are confident about controlling the diabetes, I would still use steroids if you don't, because no harm in giving steroids if you can control the diabetes well. But then again, it's a clinician's choice. Like, for example, when we did the studies on patients who were on uh, steroids, the use of steroids reduced the chance of incomplete recovery by about 10 to 15 percent. So that is a big number. And yeah. the number needed to treat to prevent an incomplete recovery is one is 10. Means if you don't give if you give steroids out for 10 patients, one person is going to have less number of incomplete recovery. So the mind you, when you use aspirin for acute MI, it is one in 25 and for stroke, it is one in 75. So one in 10 for Bell's is a very good number, number needed to treat. So Excellent. that is my answer for that. Okay. Thank you very much. Uh, here's an interesting question from Jodat Al Safadi. Can a patient be treated for this disease if he's had the symptoms for more than 25 years? Uh, you know, the, by definition, it's an acute disease. So somebody who has 25 years is beyond that definition of acute uh, facial nerve palsy. I think uh, it cannot be Bell's palsy. It, it has to be treated as a sequel of Bell's palsy. Thank you. Uh, we have a question. I hope I'm saying this name right. Aran Gazaib Shug. Aran Gazaib. Aran Gazaib. And he's a physician and he's actually asking question as a PCP, if I see Bell's palsy in the clinic, what should my course of action be? Immediate referral versus routine referral after a course of steroid? And what's the, the role of antivirals? Okay. I think this has got actually two stem. I mean, this stem has two routes to answer. The first part is, do I need to uh, refer this patient immediately or routine? My answer would be, if you are clinically your clinical examination and your history taking tells you that this is an idiopathic Bell's palsy. And if you see the patient within 72 hours, you have every right to start treatment and review the patient in your clinic subsequently. You don't have to routinely refer the patient unless you see red herrings, which I noticed, I mean, noted above. So that replies the first part of it. The second part is use of antivirals. Uh, I purposefully did not mention about antivirals. The answer is if the if the, I will go the other way around. If you use only antivirals, they are not proved to be any use in treatment of Bell's palsy. So when what is the role of antivirals? Only if you have a high grade Bell's palsy, like grade four and above. So if you add, there is an additive effect. And among the antivirals, the one which is easy to use and which is proven of better safety would be valcyclovir, thousand milligram three times a day for five days. And uh, you need to look at the renal profile of these patients before you start and also tell them that you can have headache, which is a very common side effect. Thank you very much. Uh, you know, we have a lot of questions, but unfortunately due to time constraints, we will have to limit the questions so that everybody can get out on time and uh, we don't overrun the into other people's lectures. So thank you very much, Dr. Sadir and much appreciated for your you. interesting lecture. Thank you very much. Thanks for the uh, opportunity. Thank you.
Thank you.